we can kick us, uh, I can kick us off, but Dennis and, and David, this is really your show. Um, so thanks to everyone for joining our fireside chat with David Wallace. Um, it's hosted as part of CoRise. It's actually hosted a part of Dennis's course on Dagster. And Dagster is a course that teaches you to design, build, and maintain a data platform um, that supports a wide range of data tasks. Uh, and CoRise is the company that, um, that uh, is an education platform that uh, teaches live courses to working professionals to upskill you in a number of data and um, in data science ways. So um, I'm really happy that you guys are here, Dennis and, and David. And so Dennis, I'm going to pass it to you. You can introduce David and I will be a fly on the wall. All right, cool. Yeah, so today, very happy to talk with David, who is a staff data engineer at Dutchie. Uh, prior to Dutchie, David helped build out data platforms for Intercom, Mode, Envoy, and Good Eggs. Uh, David is approaching his 10th year working in data and has a range of experience in all things from orchestration to stream processing. So very happy to have uh, someone else who's also been a longtime fan of Dagster. I mentioned it to the class, but David wrote the first blog posts for Dagster that weren't written by the Elemental team. So a very early uh, adopter of the framework and someone uh, Elemental talks with quite a bit about how the direction of Dagster. Um, so yeah, so really we want to make this open to people who have questions, but I've got a few queued up just to kind of get the conversation started, but really start thinking of questions and put them in chat. Or once we finish these initial questions, people can feel free to come off uh, mute and just um, chime in. Um, so yeah, just to kind of get things started, one, one thing with the course is there's just been a very wide range of roles of people attending it. Um, there have been analysts, analytics engineers, data scientists, um, and I'm just kind of curious what you feel is the role of a data engineer and maybe how that's changed recently. Yeah, for sure. By the way, hi, everyone. Good morning. Thanks for having me. Uh, hey, Dennis. Good to see you again. I'm sure you'll, I'll see you in a meeting after this. Um, yeah, the role of data engineer is, is sort of, it's sort of weird. It's something I think about a lot. I, I think it's, I think it's somewhat shifted over the past five, 10 years. I think if you were to ask someone, let's say five years ago, what a data engineer is, I think they would be like, that person is a plumber. They move data from A to B to C. It's, it, it's this, it's this ingrained mindset of like data engineers just move data around. I think that's like the historical viewpoint of what a data engineer does. Um, I think that's changed a lot recently. I think now the world we live in is so segmented. There's so many different tools that people use and the data platform as we know it is actually becoming very wide in scope, right? So I think what you're actually seeing is data engineer take on a much more generalized skill set, a skill set that's outside of just, you know, moving data around. And now a data engineer isn't just tasked with, you know, making sure data gets from A to B. A data engineer is meant to be able to, you know, contribute and tie together all these various components of the modern data platform, all these third-party services, uh, you know, from things like batch data ingestion to DBT transformations to training and deploying machine learning models to, you know, delivering data shares to external customers. The skill set is just so much more broad than it was, I think, five or 10 years ago. So I, I think that the discipline itself is changing. I think that the expectation is that data engineers will be responsible and be able to contribute to more things, a wider breadth of things. Um, but I think some of those historical skill sets will still, you know, um, be expected of data engineers as well. Um, and I think that also speaks to your, to your question, you know, I think that's why you start to see a lot of, you know, a lot of uh, various roles in these types of data engineering cases is because I think people are starting to realize that the skill set of, you know, an analytics engineer, a data engineer, an ML ops engineer, a data scientist, these skill sets are sort of just coalescing at this point upon like a common, you know, again, wide breadth of skills. Uh, and I think that's why you're starting to see so, so much role diversity, um, specifically in the data engineering realm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, I think that makes sense. I think kind of like you're talking about, I think the roles kind of evolved with 
companies and just how they view data as an asset because it used to just be let's gather it together and then then magic um and now it's <laughs> much more like there's kind of magic throughout <laughs> like the applications totally. and products so there's kind of a lot more points of interaction for kind of data driven solutions and products to be built rather than just this thing of like oh if it was all existed in one place then we could just solve everything and then because then it's all easy um but totally yeah. <laughs> so yeah kind of along the same lines just curious what you've seen as far as like data engineering patterns and anti-patterns and just kind of like best practices when building out applications based around data yeah for sure i think that a, a lot of the a lot of the, the patterns that I've seen develop over the past couple of years um, are really just patterns that I think data engineering and analytics engineering, et cetera, are starting to just crib from software engineering in general, right? Let's just say DevOps, um, you know, things like uh, resiliency in distributed app applications, things like that, things like that Dagster, for example, do really well. Um, a lot of that is just essentially cribbing from um, standards that have been developed in just software engineering uh, and application engineering over the past couple of years, right? Um, so it, it's nice to see those patterns start to move their way over to data engineering. Um, as far as, as anti-patterns go, um, I have two in mind. One is a tactical anti-pattern that I think is also changing rapidly for, for the in a good way um, over the past few years. And one is just more of a philosophical anti-pattern. Um, the tactical anti-pattern that I think we're all probably familiar with with data engineering is testing in prod, <laughs> right? Uh, it is historically a really hard problem. For, for data engineering. Um, and I, I think the reason for this is that I, the, in, the inherent nature of data engineering is that you are going to likely interact or have to interact with a pretty wide variety of services that are um, within or without or outside of your control, right? Um, it's very different from, from application engineering where um, you can use a variety of technologies and services, but those services are often uh, completely under your, your, your control in some regard, right? Let's say like there are AWS resources that you control like a database, uh, an EKS cluster, things like that. Data engineering is, is a little bit different um, because you're just, you, the inherent nature of it, again, is that you're touching so many external systems that are just outside of your control. Um, and I think that, that nuance um, with what data engineering typically looks like as far as workloads, that makes it very hard to establish patterns that are like truly isolated uh, as far as like environments, the environments that, that they touch. And I think that historically, I think you see a lot of, like you see a lot of data engineering teams sort of fall victim to the mindset of, well, it's just really hard to, you know, but be thorough and test in a non-prod environment. So we're basically just going to test in prod. <laughs> we're going to ship right to prod. And you know, if it doesn't work, then we'll roll it back and we'll do something else. Um, again, I think that's that's changing recently. I think the tooling is getting a lot better. I think those gaps are starting to close as far as um, you know the capabilities of these tools and these services that we use to have these like truly isolated environments that are meant for testing um, outside of production. So I think that's changing. But historically, I think that's at least one anti-pattern that I've seen. Um, philosophically, I think another anti-pattern, again, that I actually think is changing recently um, pretty rapidly in the advent of things like Dagster, for example, um, I think data engineers uh, have a tendency or, or historically have had a tendency to think in terms of pipelines and not as much think in terms of products, right? I think that you, you hear a lot of people refer to all of their job basically in, in the, frame, the framework of a pipeline or a number of pipelines, like my pipelines do this, my pipelines do that. Um, but again, historically, there hasn't been much chatter around the products that, that data engineers are actually responsible for delivering to stakeholders, right? I think that mindset is changing, and I think that, that data engineers specifically are starting to really put the, the actual data products that they deliver at the forefront and think of all of the work that they do in terms of those products and the SLAs and the contracts around those products that they deliver, and less about the actual infrastructure, less about the pipes, right? So it doesn't matter as much what creates these products. It's all that matters is that I am upholding a contract and a set of SLAs um, for the products that I deliver. So I think that that's changing. But again, historically, if you look back a few years, um, it, it really has been centered on thinking in terms of pipelines and not so much in terms of products. Um, so I think that that is more like a philosophical thing. Again, I think that's rapidly changing right now, but just um, just something I've noticed over over my time in the in the data engineering sphere. 
it's almost like we work together. I think yeah. people people in the class have heard me mention both these things because yeah, I think the things that really ex excite me about Dagster were, were things that kind of come across as boring at a high level where it's like, oh, you can like front load your testing and you can catch all your errors on your machine before you even push things into the cloud. And that the, that, that if you kind of haven't been in the weeds, that that doesn't seem the most glamorous thing, but it's like understanding just how amazing that is. Um, yeah, that's so true. It is one of those things where it does require a certain level of um experience and just I, I would say like it almost requires you to be a little jaded <laughs> in in a weird way i think you have to have seen it and been through the trouble uh before to really understand like the true value and, and the impact that it has um but yeah I, I totally agree i think that stuff is is like critically important yeah but i think it's also nice to yeah to your point moving more towards a product focus um for data applications just because one, it's easier to maintain those long term. It's easier to get kind of company wide buy in, and those are just nicer to kind of support over their lifespan. Um, I th it's I th a couple. I don't. Know, it used to be much more that like you really had to like data engineering to stay in it because it was that thing. Yeah. It's like whereas like people would let you know when you were wrong, um, but never really let you know when like things were running well. But you kind of got that totally. thing of if anyone was missing their data, you heard about it, but the no one no one talks about like um, a successful pipeline run. So I see that's that's a great point. And that's what I was I was just gonna say I think I think one of the nice things about this like shift in mindset is that it actually I think aligns it aligns the way that stakeholders think of data and data engineers think of data right now or historically there's been this weird misalignment right where it's like your consumers your the people that consume your data products pretty much i, I hate to say it do not care about your pipelines at all <laughs> i think that's the unfortunate reality all they really care about is the product that you are delivering to them um the pipe is abstract to them the task is abstract right um and for the data engineer i think historically the task has been number one the, the pipeline has been the, the the main point of focus right and i think this recent shift of thinking in terms of products and again contracts slas around products actually aligns the way that the stakeholder and the data engineer the provider think of of, of data um so i think it's ultimately a good thing just to even just from like a philosophical standpoint of like um achieving that that level of alignment yeah so kind of along the same lines, are there any trends in data that you're particularly excited about? There's data is always great in just throwing out buzzwords and then seeing what kind of sticks around. So anything that you're hoping sticks around? Yeah, yeah, for sure. Um, there, there's there's like two there's two things, two trends right now that I see. Um, one is, and I'm sorry, everyone, don't hate me. I'm going to use data mesh. I'm going to say data mesh. Uh, I said it, it. It's inevitable. It's like crypto. It comes up at least once in every in every conversation. Um, I'm excited about the idea of a data mesh. I, I think practically it will look different than what's being described right now. But I think in theory, what everyone is describing is probably the right way to go. Um, and I think that you're already seeing uh, some form of adoption in most orgs without most orgs even knowing that they're adopting like a mesh architecture, for example. Um, I actually think a great example of this, and, and one of the reasons that I personally think that data engineers will probably be one of the first disciplines to like truly adopt some early form of a data mesh architecture. The reason I think that is because the tooling is maturing into a place where mesh architecture is becoming a reality. And I think I just saw a question in the chat. Um, can I give a description of what a data mesh is? I can. It's very abstract. I will warn everyone because data mesh is such a new thing that the way it's typically described is very vague, almost in inherently, right? Because it kind of can be anything. But the idea is that there, a the idea of a data mesh, um, in theory, is that there are levels of domain ownership around products, data products that are delivered, right? So, for example, instead of like one centralized team, let's say data engineering, instead of data engineering owning every single derived data product that can exist, and all of those, let's say, live in a data lake, right? Instead, it's about giving domain ownership of, of derived data products back to the people that uh, are, that where the data originated from, right? So a good example of this is 
let's say you have a, a team at your company that works on fraud detection, right? Um, and let's say historically, there is some kind of derived data asset that data engineering has been responsible for creating and serving that is related to fraud detection, right? The idea of a data mesh is actually to shift the ownership of that derived data product back to the fraud team saying, fraud detection, you know the most about the origin of this data and how this data works and the nuances, you should actually own the product, right? You should take ownership over the, 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 the um, business logic that creates the product and the delivery and the contracts of said data product, right? Um, that's like the original idea of it. I think practically what you're seeing now is a little different, but I still think it's extremely exciting. So I'll, I'll give an example of what you're sort of seeing now. And I'll actually use Dagster as a great example because I think Dagster um, recently has become an excellent uh, like mesh facilitator, I'll say. That's a cool word, mesh facilitator. Um, so here's what it looks like now. Um, and within a tool like Dagster, you can have completely isolated code bases, completely isolated services, all operating under a single control plane, which is Dagster. And in practice, what that looks like is let's say you have one code base deployed to Dagster, one service deployed to Dagster that is uh, DBT. You have an analytics engineering team. This is the analytics engineering team owns this very specific Dagster service that all it does is run DBT models and it outputs DBT models, let's say into Snowflake, right? This is an isolated service that one team owns. Let's say you have another team at your company. This is the machine learning team, right? Machine learning team has their own code base. They do their own thing, right? They're deploying machine learning models, they're training models, you know, whatever. That lives in Dagster as well. Completely isolated service, completely isolated code bases. These two services do not interact in any like meaningful way. And one service can go down, the other can, you know, still be up, completely isolated. The nice thing is what you're seeing is that even though these services are extremely isolated from a like business logic, domain expertise, you know, code base standpoint, um, you can still and you and you will be able to express sort of implicit dependencies between them. So let's say, for example, the machine learning team relies on some data product that the DBT team or the analytics engineering team um, produces, right? The machine learning team says, we need this data product to train our machine learning model. So we have this implicit dependency on this other team. We need a product that they produce in order to do our thing, right? That those implicit dependencies, those data product to data product dependencies can actually be expressed now in code. You can say, machine learning team can say, my stuff runs, but my stuff only runs when the analytics engineering team delivers a fresh materialization of this specific data product. So Dagster being the control plane, the machine learning team can say, hey, Dagster, I depend on this, that this other team owns. I don't know how it gets produced. I have no idea. All I know is that I need it. And not only do I need it, I want you to tell me when it's fresh so that I can go get it and do my thing. To me, that is like the first step. And that's like the infancy of like sort of like a data mesh style architecture, right? It's Dagster acting as the control plane. It's Dagster acting as the mesh facilitator. And it's it's essentially, it's wiring up all of these implicit dependencies on data products that live in very isolated domains. And it's letting these teams express these dependencies in a very, very lightweight, um, but also at the same time, a very robust way, right? So that trend, I think we're going to see, I think we're going to see more of that. I think that teams want to operate like that. They don't want to live within, you know, monolithic code bases that just house, you know, all the data, all the data things at a company. I think teams want to be agile. They want to be isolated, but they are going to have these implicit dependencies. I think it's just the nature of the beast when it comes to data, right? Um, that's super exciting to me. Um, the other thing I think is really exciting, and again, going back to the whole idea of like control plane, um, and, is that I think you're starting to see orchestration frameworks, specifically Dagster in, in this instance, and this is super exciting to me. I think you're starting to see Dagster start to adopt um, sort of ideologies from, let's just say like, I'm gonna use Kubernetes as an example, right? I think Dagster, specifically really is aiming to become like the true control plane of the data platform, right? And when I say control plane, I mean it very literally in the same way that Kubernetes is a control plane. I mean, basically it's shifting the focus again from pipelines to reconciliation. I think reconciliation is like gonna be like the big keyword in data engineering over the next couple of years. 
And what I mean by that is it's just a, it's a, it's a, it's shifting your way of talking about data products, right? It's shifting, it's a sort of a paradigm shift in thinking about them in terms of what they need to be. So like this data product uh, needs to have this schema. It needs to be this fresh every day. It's declarative, right? You're just saying, what does the world need to look like? And once Dagster has that, it has that definition of what the world needs to look like, it starts going through a reconciliation loop, right? And it's, again, it's, it's becoming the control plane of saying, how do I make the world look like what this person told me it should look like? So that this person doesn't have to think about what pipelines need to run, what tasks need to run, when do they need to run, you know, stuff like that. It's just a matter of, Dagster, here you go. The world needs to look like this. Go figure it out. I think that that is amazing. I think it abstracts a lot of nuance and unnecessary complexity um, when we think about data products. Uh, and I think, again, it's super exciting because you're already seeing tools start to, you know, shift towards that, that, new, that new paradigm shift, that new mindset. Um, so that's super exciting to me as well. Yeah, it's with data mesh. I, I think data mesh. When I first heard it, I was horrified at just how quickly it was adopted. Of like, <laughs> first time it being uttered to everyone, being like, "Oh yeah, we've always had a data mesh." It's like, no, you didn't. Um, yeah, um, it has. Like a, it, it unfortunately has like the ThoughtWorks syndrome, where it's like, like ThoughtWorks pu published an article about it, and everyone was like, "Oh yeah, we do that," without actually knowing what it is. Um, but yeah, no, it, it, it's you know, I I, I feel bad because it's 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 very buzzwordy and. Again, it is one of those things when you bring it up, you get like, you get some eye rolls for sure. But I think that it's just, it's in its infancy. I think that's the thing is that no one really understands what it is or what it should be. And I think the reality is that it's not going to be one specific thing. It's going to be more like a mindset of how you operate, right? Um, and that's perfectly okay. But yeah, I think right now, it, to me, it, it what it looks like is have some of the most advanced companies out there already adopted this in like a true, a true data mesh architecture kind of way, of course, right? But I think that in most organizations, you're going to actually see data engineering be like sort of on the forefront here uh, and sort of be, be like the first, the first early adopters of what like a data mesh architecture could look like within these companies. So yeah, super, super exciting. Nice. Well, that's all of the kind of introductory questions I had. So let's switch to some from uh, the audience. So one is, what advice would you give to someone looking to get their first job in data engineering? What skills would you look for in applicants? That's a great question. Um, but it, it's kind of a hard question to answer. Um, I think that there are a lot of really great path, like on ramps for data engineering. Um, personally, I'll give some background into how I got into data engineering. So I think that um, I, I'm a little bit of a weird path, but I don't think I'm that unique because I've met plenty of people that took, take similar paths. But um, I actually came from academia. Um, I, I, I was working in a, what's referred to as a neuroengineering lab, um, basically just engineering on the spinal cord, but I was mostly just doing data analysis, crunching numbers in the lab. Um, I was working largely in, you know, uh, like MATLAB at the time, to be honest, uh, and I don't know if anyone here remembers MATLAB, um, but that's kind of where I got my first introduction to like data analysis and like data science. Um, and over time, I just found myself being much more interested in, again, like the pipes and how data moves around and, and working with data and transforming data than I was with like the actual analysis side of things. Um, so my sort of on-ramp was just that like general interest in, in, in the pipes, right, in the underlying mechanisms. And from there, I just looked for opportunities to just get semi like closer to that. It, I never really made like a true like jump right into data engineering. It was just me digging, trying to trip away, being like, how do I get closer? How do I get closer? Even though it, like basically what that looked like in, in practice is just taking jobs in data, working in data, whether it be through like data analysis, like consulting data analysis or data science that, that allowed me to just continue to get closer to the underlying mechanisms, the underlying pipes, right? Um, in addition to that, um, one thing I would definitely recommend is, uh, I think I mentioned this earlier, but data engineering is so much more than data. I actually think it's more engineering than it is data. And I feel weird <laughs> saying that, but the engineering, the software engineering component of this job is becoming so critically important um, relative to the data portion of this job. Don't get me wrong. Obviously, they're both important, but I think that in a couple of years, it's going to be effectively impossible to be a great data engineer without being a great software engineer just because you're seeing so many practices and best practices and patterns being pulled from software engineering, DevOps, et cetera, um, into data engineering. And those expectations are getting, getting stronger around like 
how, uh, software engineering, like base software engineering skill set that a data engineer should have. So my, my recommendation is, again, if you're already into data, you're doing data analysis, analytics, engineering, um, chip away, keep looking for opportunities to get closer to the underlying pipes and things like that. Um, in addition to that, I would say I would recommend to anyone work on those basic software engineering skills. Again, um, coding best practices, patterns, um, understand infrastructure, specifically understand cloud infrastructure. That stuff is becoming critically important. Um, and I, I think it's borderline becoming an expectation of people getting into data engineering at this point. Um, so yeah, I, I hope that's a helpful answer. I know it's a little abstract, but these these things, again, these things tend to be a little abstract in nature. So curious for your take on this, because this is one follow-up question I get a lot from that is, would you recommend a small or a large company for someone who's getting their first job in data engineering? Um, I think it's very much a personal choice. I think all these things are, for me, small company. Um, I, I, the, the reason I typically recommend that is because I, I think you're just, I, I think it's, it's hard to argue this, but um, at these small companies, the trend seems to be that you're just given a much greater level of autonomy at these smaller companies than you would be at a larger company. Um, just because these larger companies, more, more is at stake, right? They're just, they're just higher stakes, their guardrails are tighter. Um, so you're not given as much autonomy to like, you know, pave, pave your own way and, and blaze your own trail. Um, small companies, in my experience, again, um, have a lot more of that. And it just gives you opportunities to discover and explore and learn new things and stuff like that. And I think that that phase of discovery, that phase of curiosity and exploration is like very, very important for, especially for the early stages of becoming a good engineer. So switching gears slightly, uh, what do you think of the modern data stacks impact on data engineering? Um, I actually think it's generally good. Uh, I think there's, there's, there is, uh, I, I'm trying to think, I think we always knew that this is a double-edged sword, right? I actually wrote an article about this so many years ago when I was at Mode, because um, I kind of saw the first stages of the MDS. Um, I, I used to work at a company called um, RJ Metrics, old school, like business intelligence company. Um, and I don't know if you, I don't know if many people here know the origin stories of DBT, um, but basically there were two spinouts of RJ Metrics. Um, one of those spinouts was a company called Stitch Data. Uh, it's basically think of it as like a you know data pipeline as a service, five train competitor, thing like that. And then the other spinout was a little thing called DBT that no one's heard of at this point. Um, just kidding, I'm, that was a joke, by the way. <laughs> um, so when DBT came out of RJ Metrics and Stitch extracted out of RJ Metrics, um, what was interesting is that Stitch the way the the rationale for it sort of splitting out of RJ Metrics. It was already a part of RJ Metrics as far as te the technology stack, right? So, like, um, what RJ Metrics was was sort of like this monolithic uh, business intelligence tool. It was the pipeline and also the dashboarding, right? And also the data modeling. It also did like DBT behind the scenes. Let's let's say that, right? Um, when Stitch split out, I was like, this is interesting. A company is starting that just does a fraction of what the other company already did, right? And now it's its own company. And the rationale was that, well, you know, people will pay for this very specific piece of technology and it will allow us to focus on it and make it really, really good, right? Instead of trying to do everything and being like jack of all trades, master of none, we can focus on this one specific component of the data stack, do it really well, and people will pay for it, right? I saw that and I saw other companies doing similar things, again, sort of extracting out, doing very specific things and then offering them up saying, hey, do you want to pay us for this like really, really specific thing that we do? Um, and I extrapolated that outwards and I said, I think this is the new trend. I think that we're going to see in a couple of years, I think you're going to see a, a modern company's data stack will no longer be two tools. It will be 50. It will be like a wide variety of tools that all do very specific jobs, but do them really well. Then that's the nice thing, right? Um, I think we gained a lot from that. I think we gained, we, we got some really excellent tools out of it, right? We got to use, yeah, the unbundling versus bundling debate. Yes, exactly. Um, but again, I knew, I knew that this was a double-edged sword. I think a lot of us did because when you start to unbundle and now you're in a place where you use 50 different tools, you sort of have, it's, it's a lot of, it's a lot of uh, wrangling to do, right? You, you have, a, there's a lot of complexity that arises from using, let's say 50 different tools. Now you have to get all of these tools to somehow communicate to one another, right? How do you do that? 
So basically what you're seeing now, and again, Daxter is a great example of this, you're seeing control planes form on top of this layer of complexity saying, we can control this. We can, we can orchestrate this. We can control the complexity of what this modern uh, landscape looks like by sort of wiring up and getting all these services to communicate to one another, sharing metadata, things like that, right? Um, so I think that's sort of like, that's sort of what you're, what you're starting to see now um, from that debate. But I think that, again, to answer your question, I think a lot of good came from the modern data stack. I think, honestly, we probably wouldn't even be here if it wasn't for that initial initial trend. But I do think you're starting to see the repercussions of it now, which is just a, a severely, a, a huge increase in complexity. Um, but again, I, I, I think that we're, we're quickly solutionizing on that. And I think a lot of tools are, are already doing a great job to help us manage that. So how do you stay discerning with all the new data companies that do much more fine grain parts of the data stack? Um, that's a good question. How do you stay discerning about it? Um, I'm not sure. I, I, I'm honestly not sure of the answer. I actually think that I, I sort of, I sort of swing on, on this on this side of things where I'm actually I, I go from being like really really excited about uh, the proliferation of, of tooling to like not wanting to touch it at all <laughs> sometimes. And I, it's actually kind of funny because I think that um you know I, I, we all know that the, the the pendulum swings with these kind of trends. I think that. What you're seeing now actually is, um, I know I already mentioned that you know you're starting to see control planes build up upon the like a layer up above the modern data stack. But I actually think what's really funny to me is that you're starting. You're also seeing companies that are like, wouldn't it be great if we just went back to the old way of doing it, where you just had one service that does everything? You know, I, I, I'm not, I won't name names. Um, honestly, there are too many to name. But you're already seeing companies pop up like that that are like isn't it hard to run 50 services? What if you just had one, right? And everyone's like, oh yeah, that would be pretty cool. Um, so I think you're, you're, start, you're sort of starting to see like a shift, like almost like a reaction, a reactionary phase to this, to the modern data stack uh, landscape right now that tries to uh, like rebundle. And again, going back to it's the unbundling versus bundling debate. I honestly think it's a pendulum. I think that we're just gonna consistently go back and forth between bundling and unbundling forever. Um, but yeah, so it answer your question, how do I say discerning? Um, I don't. <laughs> it's hard. It's too hard. It's just, it's just, it's uh, it's hard to keep up with everything at this point. Um, I I think a lot of my focus recently just has been on less. It's been less of a focus on tooling, like what tools are out there, what what cool new to tools exist, and more of a focus on just building like really solid applications. Um, so lately, I've I've been a little bit less discerning than I probably should be. Um, but it's just because my my focus has shifted a little bit. It makes sense that, um, yeah, trying to keep in mind what's cool versus what's actually preventing you from delivering something, because I think exactly it's very easy to use that as an excuse to just be like, oh, if we had service X, like this project would have been done two weeks ago. And then it's totally, then you kind of buy yourself some time just through contract negotiations, and then you can keep doing that for quite a while. That's totally um, right. Um, so from Jenna, how do you think the role of the data engineer has changed or will change with the advent of analytics engineers? I actually don't think it's going to change. In fact, I, I have maybe a little bit of a controversial opinion here. I think the skill set of an analytics engineer or, and a data engineer are much closer than people tend to think. And I actually, personally, my hypothesis, I could be totally wrong about this. I think these two roles will just converge and just coalesce at a certain point. Um, and I think it makes sense, honestly. I, I, I actually... I kind of fall on the side of the spectrum that's like, I don't think that the delineation is absolutely necessary. Um, I think that the skill sets are so close that you can probably lump them in together. And in fact, I think it does both sides good. I think data engineering could learn a lot from analytics engineering. I think analytics engineering could learn a lot from data engineering. Um, I don't think you'll start to see them coalesce. Will they ever like truly coalesce and just become the same role? Maybe not. But I think skill sets wise, I think you'll just start to see those skill sets coalesce over time. Um, so that, that's my opinion. Um, I just, I, I'm not a huge believer in like the delineation between the two. Um, but yeah, I, again, I think they'll, I think they'll start to convert over time. If there was one trend in data that I didn't love, and this is my unpopular opinion, I hate the proliferation of data titles of just mm. that you can, one that it just doesn't match up at all company to company. And that you can have a team of six at a company and everyone's a different role. And it's like, that's when you talk to software engineers and they're like, you guys are insane. We're 
we're, we're a team of 80 and we're all software engineers and you're a team of six and you're and none yeah. of you can agree on your title. I agree. I, I, I don't love role proliferation either. I think that sometimes it's good um, in the sense that like, uh, it's it's a balance, right? It's like um, when you have a very specific title or a very specific role, it does allow you to focus on something, which I think is always good. I think having like clear focus, clear objectives, very, very clear metrics about what success looks like to you. I think that's great for anyone, really. That's not even out, outside of data. It's just great to have like very clear, a very clear North Star of like, what does success look like for me? And how do I focus on that? And how do I achieve that? Um, however, sometimes I think it can do people a disservice, right? I think if you're overly focused and overly specialized, it it sort of allows you to stay within this comfort zone where you don't learn new things, or you don't even get to touch like a, a like diverse set of things within a company. Um, and I think that does some people a disservice, especially people that are actually interested in touching those things, but like aren't allowed to, right, because of their title. Um, so I think it's it's just a fine balance to be walked. I, and again, I'm I'm like you. I think I fall on the side of I, I think it's probably better to have just sort of generalized roles and then let people sort of find their specialization over time. Yeah, I agree with all that. And the next one is going to be fun. Um, uh -huh. do, do you see a greater adoption of no code or low code within data engineering? I actually think it's going the opposite way. I think we're going back to code. <laughs> I think I think um, I think code is king at this point. I think everyone's starting to realize that um, you need to touch code in order to do um, sophisticated things. Uh, and I'm, I'm a big believer in that as well. I think that uh, you know, there's an argument to be made. I think abstraction is great. It, it's hard to argue, right? Like abstraction is awesome, right? It allows us to do things that we would just not be able to do otherwise. Um, but I do think, again, with, with everything, there's a balance to be had. I think that most people are uh, sort of starting to converge on the fact that the right level of, of abstraction is code, right? It's it's a high-level language, like let's just say Python. That is the right level of abstraction. And then there's a semi-level of abstraction over top of that with something like Dexter. Dexter is like, it's not really a level of abstraction, but it's just like sort of a, a way of thinking about writing Python, right? It's, it's just a little bit different. It's like a layer, it's a framework on top of Python, but it, it you can think of it as an abstraction almost. Um, but I think that I, I, for most people that I talk to in this industry, I think everyone's starting to agree that that is the right level of abstraction. And any abstraction on top of that almost feels burdensome. It almost feels too abstract. Right. And when you when you start to abstract things away to a place where they start to feel too abstract, it becomes frustrating. In my experience, it becomes frustrating because you can't quite do the things that you want to do. And if only you were given a lower level of access to the underlying you know, machinery, you could do those things. Right. So I, I actually think that like. No code, low code, I think we'll start to see less of that. Over time, I think you'll still have to see tooling, but I think that I think tooling will actually allow practitioners to get closer to the code than they ever have before, right? Um, so I think I think that will be the trend, actually. This is the thing I was um, I would say that the biggest um, benefit was of DBT was just the mindset that people shouldn't be scared of code, and that was kind of one hundred percent what it brought to the profession um, more than any of like the actual features of uh, of the framework. So yeah, I kind of, it seemed like there was a shift more towards following the DBT model. And then, yeah, there's, I think partially, as you said, with now that there's so many data services, there, there are a couple that are like, wouldn't it just be nice to have a GUI again? Didn't we all miss that? And it's like, no, I don't yeah. miss that. Yeah, again, pendulum always swings. There's always going to be both, right? We're never going to like fully, fully converge on one thing. Um, but I, I, I agree. I think that um, you're starting to see uh, frameworks and tooling exist that they have this mindset of like software isn't and shouldn't be magic. It shouldn't feel like magic, right? You should be able to sort of dig into the inner workings here. And, and we should offer you a level of control that you may have not had previously. Um, and I think that's really exciting because I think that is companies and tools starting to put a lot of trust in their user base rather than putting up these guardrails and, and you know, not trusting their users to do the right thing. Um, I think these companies are actually starting to realize that, no, our users, our users are really smart. They're really smart we're pe people and they're responsible. And we want to give them the control to do some pretty sophisticated and advanced things. So um, I'm excited about that. That's kind of where I want to see the world go. I think it's going there. So, uh, yeah, that's that hopefully it continues that way. So along this, the same lines of just talking about data companies, 
what do you see the role of open source in data and data engineering? I think everyone's, I, I think it's, I think it's the model. Um, I would say that uh, specifically in data, I think you're just going to start to see more and more companies go open core. When I'm going to say open core, I mean um, the, the core technology is open source and then they build a product offering around hosting or something like that, right? A uh, great example is DBT Labs. DBT Labs open core. Um, you know, DBT is, we all know it's open source. DBT Labs clearly is not. Uh, it, this company needs, needs to make money. It makes money off of um, hosting DBT for other people, things like that, right? Um, there are other examples out there. Another great example is... Uh, Two good examples, actually, of companies. I, I believe I could be wrong about this, um, but I, two companies that did not start open core and have moved into the open core. Airbyte is another great example. Yep, thanks. Um, one of them is Transform, the metrics layer or the semantics layer. Um, Transform, I don't believe, started as an open source company um, ha and has recently open sourced their core technology, the Transform metric server. Um, and now they are effectively an open core company. Um, same with a company like Datafold the cataloging and uh, observability platform. Um, Datafold has started to open source a lot of their uh, quality testing framework. Um, I think you're gonna see more of that, you know, Dagster, perfect example. Dagster started open source, so, you know, give them a pass. Um, but I, I do think it's the model here. I think that you're gonna start to see most of these companies have their core technology be open source and then just build up product offerings around them. Yeah, it's nice just to be able to with everything having um, that open source component, just being able to experiment, just given the pluggable nature of the modern data stack that you can just yeah. do bake off you know, so, so much more easily. I agree. And again, it goes back to the sense that I, I think the trend is that companies are realizing that their, their users are smart, right? Their users want to be able to toy with these frameworks and, and like you said, try them out on their own without their hands held. Um, with the trust that these people will likely, if, the, if your tooling is good, these people will become paying customers at some point, right? I think that's a lot of trust to put in the user base, but I think that there's a reason for doing that. I think it's because um, we as a discipline have sort of proven ourselves or started to prove ourselves worthy of that trust, right? Uh, and I think that everyone is starting to, starting to follow the path being like, oh, okay, this is what the people want. The people want an open source core framework, core technology. They want the ability to play around and contribute and things like that. And we're going to give them that with the trust and the faith that if what we build is good, they will become customers over time. Um, I think it's great. I think it's great for companies, honestly, because I think that, uh, again, you know, uh, more eyes, shallow bugs, all that stuff, right? Um, more ideas, more diverse ideas, and including that, you know, it's like, all that stuff is great for developing technology, but I also think it's 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 great for us as well, right? We get to try new things. Um, we get to contribute to technologies that we may not have been other been able to contribute to otherwise. Um, so yeah, I just think it's great for for both parties. Another switching gears question: um, Are there other programming languages that you see as playing a greater role in data engineering? For example, GoLang. Um, yeah, you know, so I think that the two, at, at least right now for, for me, and I think for a lot of people, um, it's mostly Python and SQL at this point, but I actually do see a world where, um, languages start to move into a territory of different languages. I actually think that, um, it's not necessarily data engineering, but one of the most interesting components of being a data engineer, at least for me, and I know probably for Dennis too recently is that, um, you are much closer to infrastructure than you may have or would have been in a different, like more, you know, ordinary application engineering role. You are like touching infrastructure all the time, right? Whether it's spinning up new infrastructure or like maintaining, you know, S3 buckets or things like that. Um, the reality today is that a lot of that infrastructure is managed via code, right? I know a lot of companies have started to adopt infrastructure as code and, and things like that via like Terraform, et cetera. And a lot of that uh, infrastructure management code is written in something like Go, right? Or or even like outside of some of that is written in Rust, right? So I think there's a level of familiarity with those languages, languages like Go, for example, that actually will do you a, a huge service learning because it allows you to actually, again, sort of dig into and remove that abstraction layer of how did I get from this Terraform statement to this EC2 box, right? There's a layer of code in between there that uh, you may or may not understand if you don't understand or can't read or can't interpret a language like Go, right? Um, I know that's not like data engineering specific, 
But again, I think the trend in our role, because of how diverse our skill set tends to be, is that we are getting closer and closer to things like that, like having to manage and maintain infrastructure. And I think having that understanding outside of your comfort zone, outside of just, you know, Python, SQL, pandas, what have you, um, will do a great service to most people. Because again, it'll, it'll allow you to start to interpret that abstraction layer between uh, code and infrastructure. Whenever people are asking about getting started in data engineering, I'm just really have to hold back being like, just learn DevOps. It will serve you better than anything else. Learn DevOps. Yeah, big time. Learn, learn. Uh, seriously, it's it's great. Um, I, I, I totally agree. It's just generally good knowledge to have. Um, one other note on the on the languages thing is that um, I, there, there's, in my opinion, there's a, actually a huge disparity between languages that we use for traditional like batch batch oriented workloads and languages that we use for streaming. Um, streaming, they just live in two different worlds right now. I think the world they're starting to coalesce a little bit, like with the advent of things like materialize KSQL DB. Um, it's like this, it, it's it's these, you know, these companies trying to basically say, um, you can use the syntax and the languages that you are familiar and comfortable with in order to do stream processing things. Um, however, those syntaxes are still slightly different, right? There's a lot to learn. There, there's just a huge paradigm shift going from batch to streaming. Um, and if you really wanna get into the weeds with streaming, for example, let's say like Kafka, for example, um, you are going to have to learn something like Scala or Java, right? Because all of that stuff is still Java behind, behind the scenes. Um, so there's definitely a language like disparity there. And I think that's just really inherent to like the, the differences between the batch world and the streaming world today. But again, I, I, I still think there's even trends there of those two worlds starting to coalesce on something like SQL being the, uh, the uh, lingua franca, right, uh, of those two worlds. So um, so yeah, that's another slight nuance with the, with the language thing. Well, that is too good of a segue to pass up. The next two questions are both about stream processing and kind of its importance mm -hmm. and how you see the shift from batch to stream um, just within organizations. Yeah, um, so I personally think it, it's critically important. Uh, I, I think I think it's the future. It's hard to say that it's not. I, I think that we're just a little, it's a latent thing, right? It's, it's we're going to always probably have batch. <laughs> workloads. It's just kind of the nature of the beast, right? You're just always going to have these things. However, I do think that more core like application oriented systems within companies are going to move towards full streaming, right? And the technology is there. It, it really, it really is there. Micro batching, yeah, um, potentially it, micro batching is also like a weird term because um, technically like everything is micro batching, even like Kafka is like technically there's like there's small batches and they're just very, very small. So it's like it depends on how how small or how micro you want to get. Um, I can see micro batching being in between, but I actually don't even. Th I think we can probably, in my opinion, I think we can throw micro batching that term to the wind at this point because I actually think that the the true stream processing layer is becoming so capable right now that I don't even think micro batching is really going to be much of a necessity for very long. Um, not micro batching in terms of like what Spark refers to as micro batching, right? Um, I think that you're again. I, I think right now I, I, I use this term a lot. I like this term so much, but I think what, what you're starting to see at most companies um, is there is a push to adopt streaming, to adopt something like, I'm just gonna say Kafka, for example, and that push entails a huge data liberation phase, right? And when I say data liberation, I mean literally liberating data from the monoliths that they currently live in. Let's say an app, a you know, monolithic application database, taking that data out and liberating it to the streaming platform, liberating it to the, to the streaming cluster, right? I actually think that over time, you're gonna see more of that. I think companies are adopting that right now. And I think that over time, you're gonna see teams like data engineering start to actually shift more towards the streaming layer than they were at the batch layer. I think, again, I think there's always gonna be both. I think there's gonna be a necessity to have both, but I think data engineers will live in the streaming layer just as much, if not more, than they live in the batch layer. And in addition to that, I think you're gonna to start to see a mesh layer in the streaming layer as well. I think you're gonna to start to see products being curated and published by data engineering teams in the streaming layer that application teams and microservices can pull from and subscribe to, right? Like a good like practical example of this is, let's say in the future, a data engineering team lives in the streaming layer and they are responsible for standing up um, stream processing pipelines 
that basically combine data from like X, Y, Z stream, join it together, filter it, do some stuff with it, and then they publish a new stream out, right? I actually think that that will be like the new data product for data engineering teams. I think you'll start to see data engineering teams own uh, stream products that say like, it's effectively like a DBT model, if you think about it, in the way that like analytics engineers say, you know, um, here's a model that I made. This model is just a derivation of raw data, right? There's nothing like inherently like unique about it. It doesn't like have any new net new data. It's just a derivation of, you know, a combination of X, Y, and Z data source. And here you go. Anyone downstream can use this thing I made, right? This is a tightly curated and well-maintained product. Same thing in the streaming layer. I think data engineers will be, will say, hey, here you go. I made this thing from these streams. Here is a tightly curated product that any application team can use in their application, right? X, Y, and Z application team can all use this stream that we made. Um, I think you're gonna see a lot of, of that. So I think that stream processing, again, it's gonna, it's a shift in the way we think. I think it's gonna require companies really invest in this technology, but I do think that the trend is moving that way. So I think basically my answer is that I think data engineers will live, will start to live a lot more in the streaming layer. And I think they'll actually be able to sort of extract a lot of patterns from the batch layer and sort of place them squarely in the streaming layer. Um, so yeah, I, I'm, I'm super excited for that. Another perfectly timed segue of just um, how do you shift your mindset towards thinking about data products? And if you have any examples. That's a great question. Um, I don't, I'm trying to think of how I can articulate that. How do you shift your mindset in thinking of data products? Um, Personally, what, what I tend to do, I, I try to hold myself accountable for this, but I always try, whenever, I, whenever I'm creating a new data product, and data product is, again, inherently vague here, but let's just say my data product is um, some kind of um, table that I deliver, right? It's a good example. I try to think of it in terms of contracts that I need to uphold, right? I always try to take a step back and say, what contracts do I need to uphold about this product um, in the way that it is used and keeping in mind the way that stakeholders want to use it, right? Things like schema, things like um, data quality, like data integrity, things like even like data types, right? Even things like freshness, like um, how fresh does my stakeholder expect this to be, right? Um, those are all contracts that need to be upheld. And I think as soon as you start thinking in terms of contracts around assets and products, then it becomes a lot easier to like almost um, inherit, like just from the start, think of it, think of your pipelines and like your net new workloads like that. So a little bit vague of an answer, but I, I just try, I'm trying to like, um, I'm trying to train myself to think like that more of always thinking in terms of contracts rather than pipelines. I think that that makes sense and kind of goes back to what you were saying earlier of just when you move away from just the pipeline mindset and talk about the assets, then you're talking about what the organization's actually interested in. And it's easier to have those conversations outside of data engineering, because you're never going to go to a product person and go, all right, let's talk about schedules for this pipeline. And they're going to yeah. go, yeah. Is they're going to go, it should, it, should, it should always be running, shouldn't it? And then, and then you've already lost it. <laughs> yeah, I can't tell you how many blank stares I've received in meeting rooms when I talk about pipelines. So I, I, I definitely know the feeling. I think we have, I'm seeing one in just the chat, and I think it's kind of a good one to end on because bringing it just back to Dagster and I like this of just, if you're at a company that's not on Dagster, maybe using Airflow, any tips on kind of nudging in that direction? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so the nice thing about Dagster is that there's actually a really good path for like gradual adoption, right? Um, from Airflow specifically. Um, the whole idea, and I think that this has been a thing since the beginning, since Dexter first existed, is that it shouldn't be all or nothing, right? You shouldn't have to say like, hey, company, we need to migrate to Dexter, and it is it is a binary choice, right? It is like, we need to just migrate everything or not do it at all, right? Um, instead of that, for, again, from the beginning, there's always been this gradual path to adoption where you can say, Dexter actually lets you, not only does it have, I think like an air, basically like an airflow transpiler where it like can take an airflow DAG and like effectively transpile it into Dexter. I think that actually may still exist, but um, there's also a path for like only running some things, only running one thing on Dexter and seeing how it does, right? Um, 
Uh, personally, I think the gradual adoption path is probably the way to go. Um, and in, in addition to that, Dagster honestly may just not be right for you or your company. Like that's totally, <laughs> you know, Dagster's not right for everyone. Um, Airflow is still a tool that many, many companies use. Um, but the only way to figure that out is to actually start to gradually try, right? I, I'm personally a big believer in it. And that's that's the path that I used when I was switching from Airflow. Um, I had to convince my company to uh, to try a new thing. There was some frustration with Airflow internally. And basically my strategy was, well, let's just move this one thing over and see how it does, right? Um, that path for me and also for other people I know has worked really, really well um, of just, again, gradual, gradual adoption, um, gradual just trying Dagster and seeing how, how it does. Um, so I would definitely recommend that. In addition to that, I think there's going to be a lot of learning to do because even though these two tools feel similar, Airflow, Dagster, for example, um, they they require a different way of thinking. There's definitely some paradigm shifts between them, um, mostly because Dagster is on a path to becoming, again, much more of a declarative control plane, um, whereas Airflow is, is very much still in the um, imperative task-oriented way of thinking of like A runs before B, B runs before C kind of thing, right? Um, Dagster has all that behind the scenes, it's capable of all that. But again, the, the trajectory for the company and for the tool is that it's going significantly more towards declarative control plane style workloads. It's just saying, think about the world in terms of products, tell us the contracts need to be upheld about these products, we'll make the rest happen behind the scenes. Um, so it's a little bit of a paradigm shift as well. So there's definitely some learning to do. So again, I would recommend read up on it, sort of get comfortable with that paradigm shift, that way of thinking, and then maybe just start to gradually extract things out um, and, and see how they work for you. Well, for the long-term health of my class, I will say no, Dagster is the only framework you can use. <laughs> um, and if you want to do a data mesh and not get laughed at, use Dagster. Uh, but no, I think that makes sense to kind of focus. I always say you should, with data engineering projects, try and be narrow in the beginning and just get something end-to-end. -end. And I'm sure there are pipelines in your Airflow project that people are less pleased with than others. So if you can kind of get that working example of, hey, look at how this could be in Dagster. I think that can, you can kind of drive adoption that way, but. Completely agree. But yeah, I think that's good timing for closing out the hour. So I can pass back to Judy or. That's it. I think uh, we can end it. You guys did a great job. And Dennis, I'm so glad we have an unbiased uh, perspective on Dagster from you. <laughs> I know. I know it's funny that it's coming from me and not one of the elemental people in the class, but I don't know. They gave me a water bottle, so I owe it to them. <laughs> cool. Okay. Well, thank you so much for your time, David. And yeah, um, of course. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. And we'll have the recording that we'll share with the class later. Cool. Uh, okay. Bye, have a good day, you guys. Bye. Thanks, everyone.